It's the 2006 draft, and for the first time in a very long time, there's a rule in place that prohibits NBA teams from drafting players right out of high school. So we're here to now, and for the last 13 years, we've been dealing with this rule where players have to wait for at least a year to enter the draft. Don't have to necessarily go to high, you know, from high school to college, but you have to wait at least a year. Now, we have talk right now, in currently where the NBA stands, is to possibly getting rid of that rule. But that brings me to a couple of big thoughts. All of this, you know, what we've dealt with with the last little bit with this situation, what we're coming up to now, what they may get rid of the rule that you have to, you know, have a year in between high school and coming to the NBA. But it brings me to some thoughts. How important is it for colleges to help get players ready for the NBA? Is that is that a big deal? How important is it for you to pick the right college? Which college you actually go to? And does playing college ball actually hurt your chances to be great in the NBA? So today we're going to answer two very big questions based on those thoughts. Which colleges have produced the most NBA players and which colleges have produced the best? So let's dive in. Let's get started. This is the Upshot Podcast. We're about to break down the biggest moments in the NBA. One, three, five games with five seconds remaining. And why they matter now. This is the Upshot Podcast. All right, so we're digging in, and you know, with this question, it's it's a big one, and it's it's a lot to uh, put together. And if you've ever thought of this before, it's it's a lot of stats to put together, a lot of things. And our goal today mm. is to break down uh, this in a very easy to understand way. So th- the big questions are this: which colleges have produced the most NBA players, but which ones have actually produced the best? And and to really get into this, before you dive into those two questions, you have to really kind of talk about what really constitutes a good career in the NBA. What constitutes success? Because just getting to the NBA is huge. I mean, it's life-changing not only for you and your family, but it's life-changing for, you know, the communities that you come from, college-wise, high school, wherever wherever you're coming from. It's huge to your hometown. So there's a lot of things that go into this. So, you know, what is it that we've got that really constitutes success? And so around the room, we've got Nick Atkins, we've got Marshall Robertson, we've got Joe Baltz. What do you guys think is, you know, some of the criteria that we should mention, you know, in a couple words that constitutes being the best of the best in the NBA? Uh, for me, it's NBA championships. I think of uh, Big Shot Bob Ori and, and, and how many great teams he happened to find himself involved in. I don't think that that's happenstance. I don't think it's coincidence. For me, it's winning NBA titles. I like uh, I personally like postseason awards. So all NBA teams, you know, rookies of the year, players of the year. MVPs, things like that. That's I'm a fan of that. Right. I I, I agree with both of those. I think all star selections. I think it's not. Uh, you're not just looking at maybe the absolute best, but just guys that are solid all the way around. Uh, there's lots of guys that are really good NBA players that don't even make the all star team. So for me, if you're making that a season or two, or certainly consecutive years, that that shows you're a great pro. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I have to go into you know how long did you actually last in the league? I think right. durability is huge. Um, durability, you know, gives you, you know, more time to actually prove yourself and do some things. Uh, but, you know, in, one could argue earnings. Um, a lot of players, you know, that are earning not just a lot for a little bit of time, but over a long period of time, that that does tell some stories. Now, that's not a, you know, a perfect picture, but you stack all that up, all-stars, NBA champs, you know, whether they made some postseason teams, which has become a very huge monstrous deal in the last little bit, especially when it comes to, you know, grabbing that max or super max. Yeah, it's built into their contract. Yeah, yeah. It, and it leads into the earnings situation and longevity. So, you know, when we get into that, um, I think you take those criteria in mind when we start into this next big conversation. And this next big conversation that we're going to have is colleges. How important is it uh, what college you go to? Um, for your chances to be in the NBA. But of course, you know, that's going to lead us into, does it really matter? Number one, if you go to college, but when you go and you play for a college, how is that turning you into a quality NBA player? Is it just kind of turning you into a run in the mill player? And and this is something that, you know, I I could bat around all day, but Joe, like (laughs) we, we've got this really good chart in front of us that you've put together. And over the last little bit, um, you know, schools, uh, since since we've been taking stats on this, um, I, I don't remember how far back this is, but we're looking at what schools have actually produced the most NBA players. So right. what do you got? 
Right. So we're looking at really this is a chart we put together and uh, it's about who's been drafted the most for ABA and NBA. So, you know, college sending their players to the pros. And what's great about and where we're going to go with this podcast is, uh, you know, we're looking for the outlier, the, t- the places that surprise us. And what's awesome is, you know, the top five of this, I think most people would guess, you know, you, you start at the top of the list with Kentucky, go to UCLA at number two, UNC, Duke and Kansas. Yeah. I mean, it, start arguing it what what team you would put above those five as blue bloods of college basketball and there's certainly teams in the argument but you can't argue that one of those five don't it's the cream of the crop right yeah. absolutely and so that makes the most sense you know and um beyond that you know i see in indiana and louisville uh, those are definitely teams arizona michigan some surprises on there for me you know uh, notre dame in the top 10 yeah. they've had 58 can you graphics. name one player who's the best nba player ever from notre dame because i honestly off the top of my head i can't think of it I can't either. Is that where Lafonso yeah. Ellis went? Was that Lafonso oh, Ellis? Oh, Ellis? I, I believe Lafonso it's Lafonso Ellis, maybe? Ben Hansbro. Oh. <laughs> out of Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Right. It was that. a solid. Shout out to yeah. Ben. <laughs> nice. There's got to be a great, there's got to be a couple of great Notre Dame guys that we literally are yeah, just blanking sure. on. Yeah, I would I, think so. I, but I'm surprised to see them in the top yeah. 10. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, I look at a Syracuse and a Michigan State uh, surprising me that, you know, like I'm not surprised they're near the top of the list, but they're lower than some of those teams I see above them, you know. And then and I, I jump down like LSU. You know, I know there's some great yeah. players out of LSU yeah. um, with I Pistol Pete and yeah. Shaq and yeah. things, yeah. but at the ben same Simmons. time. Right. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, that's not, to me, a powerhouse team. That's not a, a blue blood team I'd to put me. every one of those guys over LaFonso Ellis, by the way. Just <laughs> oh, usually. Yeah. 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 I think this is where Kentucky gets a lot of hate. Um and, and, you know, I think it's funny. It's it's really easy to hate Kentucky in the context of NCAA. Right. Uh, it's just so easy. But then you, you have these guys that uh, are always hitting the national stage in, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, college basketball playoff. And then they make it to the NBA, of course, because Kentucky's. And then it sort of becomes this interesting thing. Once you start that route and you get consistent, it changes your school, but then it changes the NBA forever because once Kentucky starts on this run, Kids want to start going there. Because How do you stop them? Right. <laughs> That's the well, thing. Well, Kentucky's part of the evolution. You know, when you look at the list uh, of those teams up there, they've all vied for national championships over the years, and everyone has up and downs throughout the times. But I think Kentucky being the first to be a blue blood that took themselves into the one and done player. Uh, I know that every single one of those teams up there was maybe slower and certainly not at getting multiple, you know, let me wash out a whole roster. Uh, and be willing to restack the next year, um, but it, I mean, obviously, when we're talking best pros, you know that it's been a it's been a great uh, makeup of them and and what the success they've showed on the court too. And to support what you're saying, I mean, how long did Coach K wait on it? Absolutely. I mean, Coach K was adamant forever that he was not going to be the school hey, you, you know, that hosted the one and dones and it, look at him now. Yeah, yeah. Luell Dang pumping him out. Left after a year and it was almost like he hated it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. That was that was the first guy I remember. I mean, I think Kyrie was the first one where I think he took him knowing he would leave. Yeah. But when Dang left after the first year, it was almost like he was let down by it. like I'm not going to do this. And yeah. I'll say this, I'll say this too. It, looking at the list, we've got 1 through 30 here and Kentucky at number 1 and and Memphis at 30 and I know we're going to talk a little bit about Later, since 06, just the the absolute volume that Kentucky's had come out. But I, I wonder how much John Calipari has to do with Memphis being even anywhere on this list, right? I a know lot. he was there. I know he was a there lot. for a cup of coffee, but but and Kentucky being at the top, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. and and maybe because that guy lends himself to as opposed to Coach Where's K. UMass? I don't see him. I don't, I'm not I don't, see, I don't see Marcus Camby. Marcus Camby, nowhere but, to be found. Yeah, but I wonder, and, and you know, again, I think arguably you could say Calipari was one and done, and he may not have liked it if he was building the program at the time, but he was just, hey, you come here and play some ball, I'm going to get you in the NBA, and That's I wonder right. how much that has Yeah, to not to it. knock on the guy, but I mean, to not be, a, in my mind, a successful NBA coach, he sure has the approach to get guys yeah, to yeah. the league. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, and we get into this, uh, you know, we're, and we're going to have this chart up, by the way. We'll have a chart up on the upshotpodcast.com so that you can go kind of see what we've broken down. And you can see which schools by numbers are pretty close to numbers, which schools have actually produced the most in order. And it's it's kind of staggering. And the, the, the interesting thing is, is the deeper question is what we're starting to scratch the surface on. And we don't want to spend too much time here because we've got a bigger discussion to have. But the really interesting thing here is, like you said, which coaches were responsible because it's really hard to sort of separate the two when you've got a coach in one place for a long time. But when you have these really great coaches that have jumped to another school and they still bring this heat and they get kids to come out because they know that's the path, that's the path to the NBA. And 
I think it's really interesting to start to watch which coaches can establish that over a period of five, 10, 20 years. And so that, that's, well, in, the, that's in the same, in the same sense, you got UNC and Kansas both there, Roy Williams. Yeah. I mean, that guy was instrumental in a lot of guys getting to the league from both of those schools. Absolutely. So we look at that and, um, you know, from a school standpoint, if you were to just look at the numbers of who's coming out of the schools, you can absolutely say, Hey, Kentucky's got this down to a science of, of putting people in the NBA. But the story gets, gets a little deeper and you have to really dig a little deeper because just because you crank out, you know, you have an NBA factory per se does not necessarily mean that you are putting the kinds of players in the NBA that can be successful. And this is absolutely huge. And so we run into some very interesting stats that, you know, this really, we've not seen it since 2006 because of what we're going to be talking about soon with, you know, that whole rule, but you've got this straight from high school issue and, you know, we've got some very big names. And, and if you really look at the NBA, if you really look at the makeup of the NBA and what it's been the last 20 years or so, um, a lot of the players that have been just absolutely dominant in the NBA, it flies in the face of the whole, you need to go to college, you need a year <laughs> out to become ready to go play at this level. And so let's just talk about some of these names. And of course, top of the list, LeBron, because it's on everybody's mind right now too. Um, and LeBron's easy, but let's, let's throw some other names out there. Kobe Bryant comes to mind. I mean, the first one I can think of is Kevin Garnett. He's, he's the first one I remember. Yeah. Right. Um, he was, he was the first guy that was high profile coming straight out of high school into the league and, and making a splash. Yeah. Right. KG, KG was right there for me. Uh, I mean, we have the guys coming from the Euro, um, with, Dirk and Yao, sure. you know, coming from other sure. other countries that didn't didn't a little bit more nuance there, right? right? Like we know they're playing against some talent over there, but I'm not really sure how to calculate what kind of talent they're playing at the time versus these high school kids that we're talking about when they come out. Sure. I wonder how many other seven foot players there were <laughs> in China. yeah, and like it did, yeah, how many people guarded Yao? But like he was Chamberlain back in the day. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it, it, it's pretty interesting. So you know you have you have some amazing players with like LeBron, Kobe, KG, Dirk, and, and yeah. But you sort of get into this interesting thing. You have just these monster success stories, and that, that's what we've talked about so far. Just dominant players in the league. But then you know you're sitting around 2003, 2004 when we when you, when you get LeBron right, and that whole thing starts. And pretty quickly after you know it starts a trend for about a year where you're having, you know, a lot of kids from high school being like, well, that's the path. If I can go straight there and not have to deal with this other stuff. And then, and then the NBA gets a little gun shy and we have to talk about why maybe they got a little gun shy. We've got, we've got some players that, you know, <laughs> didn't really live up to the hype. <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, really maybe spoiled, you know, what was going on with the straight out of high school vibe uh, for a lot of other folks. So, you know, we have uh, we have an Andrew Bynum who I I want to do an entire show on. I want to do an entire <laughs> podcast because sure. that, that whole story is so interesting, absolutely fascinating. Uh, if you get into it, but you know, Nick, Nick, who else we got? That's right around that time and just didn't quite live up. Sure, to it. first one that comes to mind is Kwame Brown. I'm pretty sure MJ had a just hand to ask in, Michael Jordan yeah, had a hand yep. in drafting yep. him. Uh, that's a big one. I th Darius Miles from the Clippers, I believe he came straight yeah. out of high yeah, school, he correct? Did. He sure and, did. and he was a big deal. It, it was a it was a very big deal still, and a little bit in vogue to come straight from high school. Uh, and and look, it was because of uh, like Ben said, LeBron, but also Kobe and KG. I mean these these are the right. these are the top tier players in the NBA at this time. Yeah. Right. So I, this is this is these are the guys that put the fear factor in the NBA though mm -hmm. because oh, yeah. everything that you know the league wasn't then what it is now and so like whenever you're looking back and you say to yourself you know oh we finally got the number one overall pick you know like right now you're looking at Zion Williams and we're uh -huh. thinking to ourselves like wow we've just hit a guy you know, who very easily could have been drafted out of high school by the way right I mean, people have been and talking so, about so that. there's been obvious years where that. You know, sure. we, we've seen that with back then and we see that now. But then yeah. I think that you've got too many guys in the top five that aren't even all star guys that are being taken. And I think it's almost a scared factor for the league. I, mm -hmm. That's what I think. I mean, the issue has to be like, are we, you know, hurting teams by drafting 18 year olds at this point? Right. And, and there's other factors involved, too. But uh, I think the league got scared of uh, the unsuccessful stories that were taking place, whether it was the financial piece of it or the players not turning out and are they just too immature to be ready to be right. playing with men no at doubt. this point? Right. Well, and we get into sort of this next thing is right around this time, um, the NBA starts freaking out and this caused a lot of controversy, especially when, you know, two, three years earlier, you have arguably one of the best players of all time 
that comes directly out. And, you know, we have the benefit of looking back now and understanding the absolute success that this person had in LeBron James. And, and it's just, a, it's an amazing story. But then you got, you know, you got a Kobe uh, that can jump into your mind was pretty successful too. He did all right. Yeah, he yeah, did not okay. bad, right? Yeah, okay. yeah but, yeah. but you know, LeBron's also coming out in a man's body. I think that's the one thing, you know, like Great when you talking about are they are they <laughs> are they ready for Kobe yeah. was not Kobe, his, no, his rookie no, season, he no. caught so Not that much great heat. of a body. Yeah, not a great body. Not a great body. <laughs> that hair was phenomenal. Yeah, was but, great. I mean, I remember just, like, loving to watch Kobe fail because I thought, this guy's <laughs> not the, he's not the he next thinks he's Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. 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 This yeah. guy says he's Michael Jordan. I just watched him airball the game winner right there. <laughs> he's pathetic, you yeah. know. But he was a year out from being really good and two years out from being phenomenal. Sure. And yeah. so that I, kind I, of. I, th I think what shocks me about it is, is that the. the, the when this uh, change in the rule came 2006, by the way, 2005 right. is when they decided that the next year. And so 2006 it's a collective bargaining thing. When you look back and you look at it on paper now, I mean, I, I still, it almost doesn't register to me. So it's like, look, these guys are coming in and they're not ready to play. The, the, the talent isn't there, but also you're looking at what a year and they're going to be exactly. 19 and is they're ready to go. And, and so it, it's really, and, and we're starting to see it now. I mean, we're seeing it with kids who are just like, I'm going to go play overseas and get paid. Right. And then, and then I'm going to enter the draft. And I'm almost a little surprised that we don't see it more often. Maybe exactly. we don't because they're so young. But it, I think the NBA, what they were trying to do was twofold. It was like, we're, we're getting a little embarrassed here. Right. Uh, these, these guys clearly aren't ready to play. How much are we playing into this as far as fostering this type of stuff? But also, if they get into college and they play better competition than they did when they were in high school and just dunking over everybody. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. Maybe they're going to be in and the product that we get is going to be better. And, and again, for me, the, the, looking at it on paper from 18 to 19, I'm like, I don't see a huge yeah. difference, but maybe look, I think, do you I think maybe it has, been. do you guys remember how you felt? Because I know for me, like I thought it was a good rule. Like when it came yeah. out, like maybe, maybe as I was a huge college fan or whatever. I just thought, yeah, these guys need to be in college. Yeah. These guys, you know, so what if LeBron played a year at, at Florida? Duke? I yeah. think is what it was going to be. Yeah, I thought like, it was going to be the University of was Florida. Was it really? I, and maybe I'm, oh my gosh. I, maybe I just, That'd be awesome. I yeah. just remember being an advocate of that at the time, thinking this is what's best for sports. And, mm -hmm. you know, looking back and, and knowing what I know now, I don't know that I agree with myself, but yeah. you know, it's interesting to think about, you yeah. know, where, where everyone's mind was at And think time. about where the game was, too. I mean, it, it, the game then, at least when that change in 06 was, look, I thought for me it was not a time of basketball that I'm enjoying near as much as I am now. Absolutely. I think the players are better now. Absolutely. Right? And, and so uh, it was different. I think it was it was a different time. So and this, this gets into some interesting things for me because, you know, you have you have me that sits and thinks about this rule and says, you know what? Um if a team is dumb enough to draft someone that, you know, out of the seventh grade uh, and, you know, and they can't play, that's, that's their own, you know, it's their own thing. You're right. And and so that's, a, you know, Bronny, I, I feel like there's <laughs> a, I take Bronny. there's a level of responsibility <laughs> as a team that uh, I, I think is sort of taken away. And I, I don't know if instead of, you know, what was actually happening behind closed doors with the owners together? They're like, you know what? We don't need to tackle this individually. Um, how can we come together to make sure that this doesn't, you know, that this is not even an issue anymore? Right. And so this brings up an interesting conversation for me. And I, I, I just have to like throw this in here. A guy like Zion, yeah. let's say Zion doesn't go to college. Does the does Zion, you know, from what you know about this guy, does Zion come out of high school and be successful in the NBA? We don't even know if he's going to be successful coming out of college, by the way. But he, he probably makes less money than he did at Duke last year. So oh, that's uh, interesting. You, know. that's, <laughs> well, you play, you play on a, you think Shaq made his money in the NBA? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's be real though. I mean, you play on a stage like Duke, it's, I mean, that's NBA junior league right there right. because right. I mean, he's playing on high profile games. He's playing on ESPN once, maybe twice a week all throughout the season. So he's getting a lot of high, pro, high profile games. And so this is, this is the point that I was trying to make. Cause I thought that this was where we would go. And the point of it is, is this, when we hit the NCAA, and we've got a player like Zion at Duke. And Zion, I mean, it was a complete game changer. We've talked about this before. A complete game changer for New Orleans. Not even necessarily for what their win-loss record is going to be this year. Mm -hmm. But they're selling some season could, tickets. Could save a franchise. So oh, let's yeah. talk about this. Sure. You know, because, you know, we all know that if you really want to hype something up, you really want to sell some tickets, you got to have some runway to talk about it. And Zion's last year at Duke was this beautiful press tour for me. No, oh, yeah, they didn't have to win it all. It was the most interesting thing about college basketball. They didn't have to win it all, and so when I when I really when I'm looking at the NBA, I'm not thinking uh, these guys need to play against more mature competition. I'm thinking the NBA sees college as 
this is the big stage. With guys like LeBron, he had a big stage before because he was just such a freak of nature. A few of his games were on ESPN, right. by the way, right. which and is exactly. crazy and, to think about. And that's, and that's why, and I think it comes down from a marketing standpoint to me, it comes down to the NBA said, we've got to give these kids some runway to get some TV time. Right. We got to get them out there to where by the time they come into here, they're already superstars. And I think that that's more of a change of media these yeah. days. You know, when you're a Zion and, you know, I, I don't know if you, you know, if you're sitting at home right now and you want to pull up, you know, Zion's social media and see where he's sitting before he ever plays an NBA game, that starts to tell the story. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really starts to tell the story of the NBA. And you got guys like Ja who, you know, we get into him and he is a very dynamic social media presence. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to go to games because of that guy. And, you know, mm-hmm. you got number one, number two here mm. coming in. And so I think that's the thing that really hits me. I, I don't buy for one second in 2006 that they all got together and were like, we want to disable ourselves from being able to pull top talent because we don't think they're ready and can succeed. I think it has everything to do. It's with, more marketable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you have, if you have college, it's basically free marketing for yeah. the NBA team that these guys eventually go to. And it's a collective of the NBA. It doesn't matter which team they go to. It's very much, we need a crop of superstars that are superstars before they even come in. So I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's such an interesting. No, I think it's valid. Can, you know, can, sure. can we play conspiracy theory Please that, do. It, that yes. it gives the shoe companies an extra year or two piece what they're Ooh. doing? Because you know what's interesting is I've always thought that the shifting recruits and, and colleges playing players is what I thought was taking place and not that it doesn't, but like how much of it is just colleges paying handlers and hmm. paying the player to go to a school that is Nike, Adidas, Under Armour, not because you. I want you to go to Duke. I want you to go to Duke or Alabama. Mm-hmm. They're both mm-hmm. Nike schools. You know what I mean? And so there's a runway of media that has a lot because no one's saying that Duke or Coach K paid Zion. That's not right. what's being reported. Yeah. It's that they're handlers and they wanted him to be at a Nike school Was is what the reports are on sure. Zion right now. So, I mean, that could play a piece in this too. Well, and we had some emails talking about, you know, wanting to pay high, play high school players, you know, at this yeah. point. And, and I think that's the thing is, you know, it's important but that by the time these guys reach the NBA, the shoe's ready to sell. That, that didn't, it didn't have to be that way before. That was not... But you look at the money in the NBA, not just in the NBA, but the surrounding properties of the NBA, it's it's skyrocketed over the last few years. And I think that's the thing. There was something with Zion. I can't recommend, I can't quite pull up, and I don't want to turn this into a full-on Zion discussion, but I think he's a perfect microcosm of, you know, would he have been as much out of college to, as to what he is, you know, if he would come out straight out of high school. There was a point where um, <laughs> Nike didn't have a shoe ready mm-hmm. recently, mm-hmm. and it was a whole, you know, interesting thing. But I guarantee you, day one, they're there. Day one, you've got jerseys um, that are designed a certain way. You've got all these, all this stuff that, if Zion's a bust, let's just say, if Zion's a bust how in New Orleans, you? yeah, I know how dare me. <laughs> if Zion's a bust, you still get this runway of merch that sure. is a huge butt before that transition. Before it happens, and, and you know he's a good person to pick on because he is such a good player. He's a lightning rod. Yeah, no yeah. one, no one wants to see the bust, but it no, is, it no. Is the, it, yeah, I'm not sure we should talk about Zion in relation to shoes either because uh, he's point. had some history issues Speaking with shoes. Bust and through your Speaking shoes. Speaking of bust, uh, terrible, the reason I think right? it could change too, if we're talking about the CBA having a new deal in 2023, I think where maybe high school kids can start coming out again. I'm interested to get your thoughts on this, Ben. Is that uh, we didn't have social media like we do back when when LeBron was. If, if ESPN doesn't exist, I don't know LeBron James exists. Right. So I'm shocked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe I would have seen it in a newspaper or something like that. But now I knew about Zion before he ever got to do right. it. Right. I knew I've seen his YouTube Probably as clips. a ninth grader. Right. I mean, <laughs> so do you think that that plays in a part that somehow the NBA or these teams can find a way to market these guys even coming from high school now? And at least in a more as far as exposure goes. Well, let's talk about this, what we're doing right now. Like we're sitting, you know, in a podcast studio that we built uh, in, in a span of a month, right? And, right. and, and it, it's, we've got everything that we put together and able to do this, but you go back about 20 years and you're having to rent out a studio to do something like this. Podcasts aren't even a thing, but to like put on a audio broadcast, you've got to rent out a studio. You've got to be at a radio station. The access is not as much, but you go into somebody now, any kid that's got a cell phone, the camera's good enough can, you know, and there's motivation for this person that, you know, maybe isn't as talented on the basketball court to be at every game that one of these guys is playing at being the person that tapes them because he's going to build a brand for himself and the person. And so there's a lot of motivation to be in the facility uh, when a star's playing. Right. And you think that isn't good for high schools? I mean, like, it's huge. It's huge. But then, like I said, you've got this huge runway. And I, I 
to go where you're going with this, I don't think you need the college runway in the next five years to build that hype. I, I just saw, I woke up this morning and saw on Instagram, uh, Bronny Jr., uh, Dwayne Wade's son, apologize, I don't know all these guys' names, but I saw that they're playing on the same high school team, and they're they're younger, they're underclassmen, but they're playing with two five-star guys. So you're talking two guys that are, you know, top 20 recruits in the right, nation yeah. playing with two guys that but are, I know about Brian you know, because of Taco Tuesday. And, <laughs> right, and absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. the point being, like, uh, you know, high school ball isn't even relevant. Like, it's club ball, sure. yeah. to be clear, yeah. you know, because yeah. those guys aren't going to play anyone within 50 points in high school. Right. Of course. And right. so what club ball are they playing? And this runway you're talking about is so long right now. I mean, those yeah. guys as freshmen are being looked at the way that guys were as 18-year-olds before – because of maybe a lack of club ball, lack of travel, lack of media presence, all those things. Well, so. Let's get into this because I think this is a really interesting conversation. Um, what we started to see, and this is this is the silliest thing to compare it to, but I think we can make the jump and you guys will see what I'm talking about. Right now, uh, my kid's playing baseball, right? And so we have what we would call kind of the community league. And this is what we all grew up with. Anybody that's probably listening to this podcast, we all grew up with like community league. You go out, it's in your community. You play a bunch of other kids in your community. It's various talent levels, whatever, but you play kids in the community. Piggly Wiggly. Yeah, I, was on, you, I was on that team. Exactly. <laughs> Napa the Auto Parts. It's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> but what, what started to happen in the last little bit, and you're going to start seeing this with college basketball um, becoming completely irrelevant, but also high school basketball, the way we know it becoming irrelevant. It, it, it's what you said. The big thing now is you're seeing community baseball die. It's going away. And it's being replaced by kids saying, you know what? I'm not going to spend my time playing community baseball with the community league. I'm going to play on a travel team. Mm-hmm. And the travel teams are where you be, you get, you know, if you're talented at all, you get the right competition. You get to play in big tournaments. You get to play against kids that are just as good as you get to see where you're at. But you also get to develop quicker. And I think that's, you know, it's sad because it's something where we should, but these kids are developing quicker. So the idea here is, is you start getting into high school ball meaning a school, does that really benefit a kid to play on a team where they're routing every week, they're routing the, you know, the conference, they're routing them by 50 points, or does it benefit them to spend most of their time outside of school playing on a travel team where there's going to be monstrous people showing up because it's the best talent in the state and out it, with their cameras. It already, it already exists. It's just not in basketball and football yet. It, right. it exists in, you know, your J.O. volleyball. Uh, it exists in your softball travel and baseball travel teams. That What you just said is exactly right. It, it literally already exists. A kid cannot play on their high school team and get a college scholarship from that. Now, is that possible in basketball? It is possible. But most people are still going to take advantage of having a practice time every day, right. playing on a high school team. But they may not care. They may not care what their high school coach says. They may not care about embracing the team and being leaders and things like that that you grow up in sports being a part of because they know that their venue to be their most successful um, pro career doesn't it, it's ineffective it, it doesn't matter at all so I definitely see that being a long term effect I, I hate it I hate that piece of it right. from a club ball standpoint I'd like for high school sports to mean more than that um, maybe I'm just old school but uh, I, I definitely well, see you're that also a coach right. well, you know <laughs> I, I think that I think the key is though is like there's always going to be room for good coaches yeah you know, in, in sure. some sort of avenue but I think the point here is is I think in the next five years college becomes a lot less important unless they do something to innovate. I think that right now yeah, the NCAA well, is not interested in anything resembling innovation. And they also make a lot of dumb moves. Yeah. All, I mean, they, they, look, the NCAA has got a lot of work to do. Okay. The, they're living off a legions of fandom. Like yeah. it has no, I don't watch NCAA to see who the next best NBA players are going to be. I'm watching my team You're and then yeah, laundry, and then I'm right. waiting for the NCAA tournament. Right. That for me in basketball is fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a venue that, you know, year to year is pretty solid. Outside of that, I'm not watching the, you know, college landscape excited to watch games. I'm, you know, at Duke UNC, yeah, that gets me up a little bit, you know. There's always the big game, but like I'm not just trying to plug in to NCAA sports right now. Well, it's, sure. it's, it's not a good it's product. It's distribution. It's distribution. And in the past you needed to go to a big school to be to have distribution and TV mm-hmm. on you. Distribution has just changed because I'm going to tell you right now, kids that are under the age of 10 years old don't watch any TV anymore. For the mass majority of them, they're watching something on YouTube. I watch, mm-hmm. I'm probably 50-50, and it's just because what we do, you know, we, are, we have a lot of stuff on the internet, but that's the thing. I'm probably 50-50, and so you start to look at actual distribution, and you can you can really build something. I have a friend who, you know, in the span of a year built a, you know, a YouTube channel that had a million subscribers, and it was all about NBA, you know, and it's, it's 
you can build your own distribution now. And NBA not cat videos. That's interesting. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, <laughs> right? Interesting. But I think that's the key is what we're really starting to figure out is the money, and you're seeing this in the NBA right now, the money is with the talent. You can't replace that. Yeah. You can't get rid of that. That's not a distribution issue. That is the person issue. Mm -hmm. But what you can build around that to actually make money, you know, you've got colleges that are not paying these kids mm -hmm. um, and they should be paid. Yeah, I think that's and I think that's the mistake that the NCAA is making, because you could argue whether the NCAA makes more money, profits more of kind of the old school model of when we were growing up and a little bit before our time where people were going for three or four years. Right. And so you're building up and maybe people are starting to watch them more on television because they recognize Shane Battier at Duke, right? Because right. he's been there for three or four years. And now we're into the one and dones where, hey, man, I hope we get a one and done. I hope we get Zion and <laughs> because people are going to watch us if we get Zion, right? Now, at 2023, if it changes and, and people are shooting straight from high school to the NBA again, does the NCAA take, take a hit? I think they absolutely do. Absolutely. What, have they, what have they done to, to try and remedy that? Did they have it, it, there's no indication that they're interested in paying the players some of these players, believe it or not, if they're not Zion level, think, yeah, maybe I do need a different coach in college who knows what he's doing and maybe to to kind of hone my craft for the next two or three years. But also, I can go and make a million bucks. You know what I mean? And get drafted 23rd, 24th, 25th. And, and Well, the NCAA did change the rule, too, to where as long as like you have – the, the ability to sign with an agent after a certain point and then come back and play college. So I, I look at that as being more of a high school rule now, you know, like, yeah. okay, well, I'm test in high market. school, yeah, and yeah. I'm going to go test it, and then if I don't make it, I'm coming back. So that one piece of it is actually going to be a hindrance to the college sure. game because yep. more people are going to put their name in the hat and kind of see, see where they happens. fall yeah. with that. Yeah. And Fish. I yeah. mean, I, I look at that draft, man, that's going to be a great time. You know, like how bad luck is it if you're the college guy coming back in and then your draft pool doubles yep. the, the high school guy are coming in but from an nba standpoint that's going to be an exciting time of, maybe a double you know, draft yeah it's yeah. like a, it's like a crapshoot for yeah, real yeah. like uh you know number one overall high school player versus number one all overall college player and so right. on so that'll be interesting well and, and I, you know i'm gonna make a big prediction here i think in the next five years i think college basketball matters a lot less you know I, you've I, also yeah you've also got the g league from the nba right they're really they're really crushing it in on the ncaa i think and number two i think in the next 10 15 years High school basketball matters much less in terms of actual, Ouch. you know, Ouch. where you're going to be. What I will, <laughs> what I will, this what this be what I will, fantastic. <laughs> go Bearcats. What okay. I will say is this: is what's going to happen to a lot of these co these college programs? Great coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to happen to a lot of these high school programs with great coaches? Is they're going to start their own teams where they make a lot more money than they would being a high school coach or a college coach because they will partner with me, with people like Nike who will sponsor them. They will have these travel teams. They will have these organizations. And, you know, you, like I said, I see it right now here with baseball. And, yeah. and you talk about profitable. You know, the other day, they, the amount of money they wanted to charge us, you know, for d depending on what league we got in and put our kid in, to put our kid in a league. And I was talking to someone last night after, you know, we recorded uh, some stuff. But it cost a ton of money, and the parents are willing to pay it because they know if they place their player in that organization, their player is going to be infinitely better than if they were on a – normal thing yeah, you're paying for lots of things you're paying for exposure one right. i mean i hear kids say all the time like hey coach i won't be at this because i'm going to nashville this weekend or i'm going to dallas and I, i'm like well you've been to five straight tournaments why are you missing a high school event and they're like well there's going to be a lot of coaches there there's yep. a lot of people that'll see me and i I think to myself, well, you've what were the other five tournaments you've been to? But that's part of what you're paying for, yep. or at least what parents are being told that they're paying for. Well, and, and I agree. And I think that, you know, right now it's sort of early stages of it, especially when you get into basketball. But I, what I think is over the next few years, it's people are going to start to figure it out. And when they start to figure it out, um, everything changes. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think that the people that, like, like your coaches, your players are going to have to adapt to it. And when they do, I think everybody gets paid probably what they're worth um, earlier. Cool. But I also think, and this is the big one, I think the NBA gets a lot better. All right, so went off on a little bit of a tangent there. So I, let's get back to exactly kind of the point that we're all going for. Which colleges do you think have fared the best uh, getting players in since 2006? And, and like, why? What players are we talking about here? So around the room. Sure. Yeah, I think we'll all agree it's Kentucky has Absolutely. done the best job, number one. I mean, I, I'm looking at the list here. The, the first, the first pipeline. few teams of Kentucky yeah, might be it, the it's, best it's, ones. It's insane. <laughs> I've, I've, just going back to 06, 
Rajon Rondo, John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins, Eric Bledsoe, Anthony Davis, Julius Randle, Carl Anthony Towns, Willie Cauley Stein, Devin Booker, Jamal Murray, and De'Aaron Fox. And so I, I think John Cal- yeah, John Calipari <laughs> set himself up. I think he's been doing that for a long time. A, 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 as far as what does that guy have that puts him in the position to understand that? You're looking at it. He's at every NBA draft. If you're a high school kid and you're looking at seeing where you want to go, he's sitting next to these guys and he's just going table to table to table to table, multiple drafts. He's got guys going. And and what was the beginning of it? Like, what was the thing that started that run? Because you have to, you well, have that's, to what, that's what comes into question. Yeah. That's, you know, <laughs> it's maybe we're not a sure different what pod. set the ball rolling. Yeah. Yeah, maybe but. that's an entire, you know, but, but you know, he, you have to be in a position that once that starts, you capitalize on it and you keep pushing it because sure. you have to be able to recruit off of that. Yeah. But I, I think that's really interesting. Nobody so. does. Nobody does that better than him. Yes. I mean, he is, he is the quintessential guy of if I'm a, if I'm a top tier high school player, I know that I can go play for that man and he's going to do everything he can in his power going to, the NBA. to get me to the NBA. That's right. That's it. You it's it's that basic. Who else? Any other teams you think doing really good? Yeah. I mean, there's several um, top of the list. I think, I think your next one's got to be Duke. Um, I mean, just, just naming five off the top of my head. I'm thinking of like Kyrie Irving, Ugh. um, Jason, <laughs> Jason Tatum, Brandon Ingram, Marvin Bagley, Justice Winslow. Like yeah. there's a pretty good starting five. right Zion, there, I think. We don't, we don't, we think, yeah, Zion, yeah Zion's yeah, I mean, going to be there. Yeah. There's no I, doubt. He's interesting thing there. about that too, is that I know we talked about this earlier, the reticence of coach K to really embrace the one and done thing. And then you look now and. It, 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 because now I'm you, pops coaching the, the, the Olympic stuff. Right. right. And, and it's the first time that coach K has kind of gone away from that. And I, I really think coach K uh, you, you hear rumblings about him leaning into that quite a bit about this is his relationship. Yeah. I got LeBron on my, on my cell. You know what I mean? And that, that speaks volumes for, for when you're competing against coach Cal to get people to come to your school. Right. For sure. All right. So Kentucky do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, UCLA has been a perennial. I, I, I jump out at UConn. I think that's one school that's really impressed me. You know, going back to that uh, sheet we had earlier where we're talking about the school that had the most drafted, they fell at like number 25 on the list. Yeah. And yet quality wise, yeah, yeah, really, really good up there. Yeah. And, you know, I think of a Kimba Walker here recently, we had Ray Allen from there, yep. DeAndre Drummond and, and just a couple of real Rudy quality. Gay. Andre Rudy Drummond. Gay. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Hashim Thabit. Hashim Thabit. Anyone yeah, remember him? Oh. All those Memphis time. Grizzlies fans out there, shout out. Yeah. Uh, rough, rough. Uh, so, you know, that that's a good list. Any any honorable mentions that you feel like maybe maybe haven't produced the most, but have produced some quality players? Yeah, I think there's a few. And, and Joe Joe touched on UCLA. Um, obviously, I think Kansas, you got to consider them. Oh, they're they're parentally pretty good, but they, they don't produce the, just the top tier guys typically. Um, but I look at a team like Texas, a, a school like yeah. Texas, oh, it's got... Uh, produced Kevin Durant, LaMarcus Aldridge. Then you got some other guys who are pretty fringe guys. DJ Augustine's had a pretty had mm-hmm. pretty solid Tristan career. Thompson Tristan Thompson got a title. Not yeah. bad. Is it Avery, PJ Tucker, Avery, Avery Bradley, yeah. hopping around the league still, mm-hmm. still doing pretty good. What do you so. think about Oklahoma? What do you think about Oklahoma? One. Because Oklahoma's one. been through a few coaches throughout this span, but Blake Griffin's one. I mean, I'm I'm putting a premium on Trey Young now. I guess yeah. I know Marshall does. You know, that was made pretty clear to me. Uh, and Buddy Heald, who I know, you know, he's kind of an under the radar guy. He's not a top twenty guy by any means, but, but he's still rising. Re- yeah, he's having a really good, still a really good time out there in Sacramento. So I think Oklahoma was. Yeah, like Oklahoma's kind of got a guy on their team every year that is a national picture. Right. You know? yeah. And and part of that's Lon Kruger too. The way yeah. he runs his offense, he's running it through a guy and and everyone else is supplemental. And so if you want to be that guy, that's really solid. Well, that's what we're talking about, right? right? We want to get these kids to come to school. Another one was Florida. Now yeah. I, I don't know about so much as as more recently, but when you're going back at least since six, they had Horford, they had Joachim Noah Bradley Beal. I mean, obviously that's a big one. And you know, why, why the hell not tossing Chandler, Chandler Parsons. Parsons? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, Chandler. Parsons. The, the promise of Chandler and, and, and what he turned out to be. I'm trying to think if I've, he's, he's really rich. We got to give him that. He's, he's, he's in there on the earnings part. This is an interesting one. And I'm clearly stretching <laughs> here to try to fit a narrative, but I looked at, I was a little surprised by Washington uh, oh. since 06. So, but, but what's interesting about that is, is guys that uh, Brandon Roy, who we all know about the promise of Brandon Roy. And, and I'd love to talk about more about that another time, but Isaiah Thomas and DeJounte Murray, both coming out of Washington. Oh, not bad. And, but two of those guys clearly having, you know, kind of career ending injuries that are that are really awful. And, and we're hoping Murray comes back and bounces back for the Spurs because I think he could be phenomenal. But well, I, I really like to see school, like schools that I don't think so much of right. like that. that and I could go the other way, uh, you know, being a, a stat guy here. I, when I looked at it, I think Joel Embiid was the only player from Kansas to mm-hmm. make an all-star game since 06. Isn't that crazy? I mean, wow. from Kansas. Crazy. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that Kansas hasn't produced a lot of great pros. Yeah. But, I mean, 
Really? Not, not one, one criteria? You got the yeah. Morris, you got the season Morris season Twins, you got Wiggins, you right. got Chalmers, you got right. all these players, but Absolutely. you're right. None yeah. of them and are that, all-stars. And that included a national championship out of that team. Yeah. Not what, yeah. I mean, that says a lot about Bill Self. i got to be honest with you. We, did, should, with UCLA, I mean, you give it a little bit more time, but if Lonzo pans out into, into yeah. anything that we think he could be, That's Zach, not a bad five, Zach, Zach Levine in Chicago, I mean, he gets on my nerves. He's a, clearly an, an <laughs> offense first guy, but, you know, he's, he's pretty good. And then Drew, Drew Holiday is Drew Holiday. Plays awesome league. And so just take the three right now where you've got Westbrook, Kevin Love, and Drew Holiday from UCLA in the past 10, uh, within the last 15 years. It's pretty good, man. Yeah, that's solid. I think think another school that we would be talking about had it not been for the major bust of Greg Oden is Ohio State. Yeah. Because you got you got guys like Mike Conley, you Conley. got uh, De- D'Angelo Russell, D'Angelo. Yeah. Turner, um, Evan Turner, Jared yeah. Sullinger, yeah. Like all these pretty solid Costa Kufas. Costa, I, I mean, who? Yeah, everybody love loves that Costa. Guy. But so they, I mean, had a lot of guys over the years that have been real solid NBA players, but because of that major bust in Greg Oden, it's like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know if I'd put him up there. Right. So you know, and and this is just an interesting one. We we talked about colleges producing the most, uh, you know, NBA players. We talked about you know. Does that really matter? Is that even the best way to become, you know, a quality NBA player? So you're getting quality. Uh, which colleges have produced the most uh, NBA champions? And that's an interesting stat. Um, and and I, I'm pulling from a little bit of a, mm-hmm. a, you know, we'll we'll have to go back and get this stat 100. percent But you can know, I take a guess? Yeah. I, I, that, well, that was the next thing. Is I want to go around the horn. Who do you think um, has produced the most NBA champions as a college? I'm gonna go. Eat. I'm gonna say North Carolina. Okay. Who you got? Gosh, that's a good one. Marshall, I mean, North Carolina's good. It's tricky, Champions. right? It's it's a yeah. tricky, tricky it's, question. It's a, it's a hard one to step. I mean, off. North Carolina's a real good one because you get if to step right out. If with it's six, Notre Dame, there it is. I'm going to flip this six, table. Sure. I, I'm going to go with Louisville just because that uh, that's my under the radar of, of the great NBA players that oh. haven't necessarily been all star caliber. I think I throw UCLA in there. Okay, for sure. So. We'll check these stats because obviously there's a couple different ways you can look at this. Like, you know, we're the players on the same team, you know, all this stuff, but like champions by players, uh, UNC. Yeah. yeah. You know, and we're by far and away, we're, we're at like 32 champions, you know, in, yeah. with 18 players. Sure. Sat in seat so one. 18 players, <laughs> 32 championships. Now this is, this is interesting. Number two on this list and, and we're pulling from, and I'll have to pull this up because this is someone pulling stats for us, but I thought this was fascinating. University of San Francisco. No, oh, that's Bill Ch- uh, Chamberlain, right? We've got Bill, Bill Cartwright, Bill, Cartwright, Bill Russell, Bill, Bill Cha- <laughs> Bill, Billy Chamberlain. Is that him? <laughs> we got Eric. <laughs> killing me. Wilt the Stilt. The Stilt. And this is and it's interesting. And then, and then we've got Ohio State coming in, you yeah. know, right underneath. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got uh, UCLA. I would right think Michigan State would have to be on there somewhere. Uh, another good one. Kentucky yeah. comes in fifth yeah. on that list. Mm. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll publish this list and I'll link to where we actually found this. And if it's complete BS, then, you know, that's cool. But like some good research went like into to this. Dig into that some more. That's, it, that's a cool. great question. And so, yeah, it's when you start to look at that, it's, it's very, very interesting. So a um, couple key things with these players. You know, do, do you agree um, with, you know, everything we <laughs> said today? Uh, I, I want to know your thoughts. Is college a necessity to be a well-rounded NBA player? What are the reasons that the NBA put the rule that you had to, you know, at least sit out a year after high school? What do you think the, re- the real reasons are? Now, we went into this in depth today, uh, but what do you think? What do you think of the real reasons that actually went into place back in 2005, 2006? Do you think that the NBA should reverse that decision? I think after listening to us, you know exactly how we feel about, but we want to hear what you think. Go to upshotpodcast.com. Let us know what you think. If you disagree with something, tell us about it. We want to know. Tell us uh, what we missed. Remember, you can grab show notes, any charts that we use to put this together, any research that we put together. We try to be very diligent with uh, putting it together. We're not always going to be right when we pull stuff uh, out, uh, but we try to source everything. And if we miss something, you should tell us about it and link us to that too. Leave it in the comments. And make sure, because this is how we know that we're doing a good job. If you're digging the Upshot podcast, go to iTunes and subscribe, or you can subscribe at any place that you're listening to your stuff. And hey, you got something that you want to hear about? Tell us. We want to know what do you want to hear us talk about on this show. Our whole goal is to break out the biggest moments in the NBA and look at it maybe in a way that you didn't initially and talk about how it's affecting the NBA today. So thanks for being here. I know I had a good time. I hope you had a good time and you can find more of us at upshotpodcast.com. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Upshot NBA Podcast. If you like what you heard, make sure to click the subscribe button so you can get a new Upshot episode every week. week. And make sure.
make sure to leave us a review on your podcast app as soon as you're done listening. Up, up.